I am very happy to welcome everybody to the session called Navigating the Inner Journey. And our speaker today is Charlotte Lindy. And I think you were probably able to read something about her in the, um, in the announcement about this. But I just want to say that Charlotte and I have known each other for a long time. I think we published short versions of our dissertations as articles in language in successive issues of language <laughs> and many, many years ago back in the 70s. But Charlotte has a great, had a great uh, title during her work, which was socio-rocket scientist at NASA. What a fine thing. And I don't think they could ever find another socio-rocket scientist to replace you. I'm delighted to introduce you to the LCL participants Thank you. and welcome Charlotte. Thank you. Welcome everybody. Um, okay, so um, I'm so glad to see everybody and I, I hope that um, what we're gonna talk about today is going to be uh, useful to you. Um, I'm going to just, um, I've color coded my, my own professional journey where the, the academic stuff is in blue, um, the running my, starting my own business is in red and the in green is um, um, re various research institutes, um, Institute for Research on Learning and then on uh, later NASA. So what this means is I have a fairly wide experience in various, working in various contexts. I, I have not worked directly in industry, although I have done um, research projects studying various industries, including a, an ethnographic study of a major insurance company, um, et cetera. So somewhat where I'm coming from. Next slide, please. So, Here's what I am up to. Um, I intend to talk about the, um, the emotional and social aspects of this issue of linguistics outside the academy. Um, for people who may be considering it, people or maybe early in their um, academic careers who are seeing it as a possibility, um, if, you know, people who are, you know, are definitely clear they are leaving the academy, that could be um, students, it could be faculty members who are also thinking of um, moving to non-academic employment. Um, what I know and what I don't know, well, what I, I don't know is very large, but um, sort of in this context, um, I don't know that much about being a faculty member. I was always, I was never a tenure line faculty member. So I have never in my life been to a faculty meeting. So um, some of what I say about faculty has to do with um, what I've heard other people say as I talk to them about these matters. Um, I certainly know what it's like to leave an academic job um, and, not, and, and be uncertain, not know what I'm doing. Um, also, as in terms of the experience of finding your way in um, the business context or finding a way to connect your linguistics work with, um, you know, with employment, um, I'm a sociolinguist by training and I've sort of slid into being an anthropologist. I'll talk about that later. Uh, so I know much more about that than I do about formal linguistics because the, the relationship of formal linguistics to research institutes and uh, corporations is, is very different. So, and I mean, I, I know that from afar, but I should say also that I, broadcasting here from Silicon Valley, um, which is a, um, a non-existent place. If you look for it on a map, it doesn't exist. But if I, if I say I'm on Silicon Valley, you, you will know where I am. If I say I'm in Redwood City, 
you will not know where I am necessarily. And I, I've, you know, I, I, I'm also speaking from being an absolute participant in Silicon Valley culture. Um, and one thing I, I want to say, um, I find this, um, this, this is important. Um, anything I say will not be true for everybody. You know, even, you know, even something that I take as completely obvious as um, navigating the journey from academe to something else is emotionally fraught. I have come across a few people who say, well, no, it wasn't, or no, it isn't. So um, don't think that I'm, you know, as I describe various emotional re responses, don't think that, you, that there's something wrong if, you, if that's not what you're feeling. Um, this is not, um, you know, th th this is not um, required. It's just something that I often see. And then finally, what I'm going to try to do is talk through one or two slides, you know, on a topic, and then try to take a few, um, a few questions. Okay, so um, what I'm talking about as an inner journey as you know, as, you, as you're doing the work of finding your way to a new career, or for faculty members um, who are trying to assist their students um, do this journey, there are, I mean, there, there is inner exploration as well as the practicalities. And uh, I'm very impressed by the attention that this conference is giving to practicalities. Um, but there are some very existential questions that come up, like, um, who am I? Um, am I a success? Am I a failure? How do I know? And am I still a linguist if I leave the academy? And does that matter? I'll, I'll come to all of these later. Um, but that's what we're going to be talking about. OK, next slide. Okay, so fear. Um, for many people, not everybody, but for many, many people, there is a great deal of fear involved in that, that point of transition or that, those years of transition. Um, for me, I, I have a memory of, um, I was a visiting assistant prof professor at the University of California, Berkeley. I was on a one-year line. There had been some talk that it could be extended, but it wasn't. And I remember in the spring break, sitting in the, a friend's living room and suddenly realizing I have no idea what I'm going to do next. And I was so shaken, I went and sat in the corner and cried with terror because I really felt like I was sailing off the edge of the known world. And different people may experience this differently. As I said, for some people, um, not at all, but the majority, there, there is some variety of fear involved. And I've bolded this next one because I think if there's one takeaway that I want you to that I, that I hope will be useful for you in this talk and that it will be a takeaway is how to deal with fear. So first of all, it is absolutely reasonable in this situation to be, a fear, to be afraid. This is a big life change. Um, it may not have been how you, expe you expected your life was going to, to go. So you are not being neurotic or incompetent or you know, what, whatever kind of self-blame you might turn it into, don't. This is absolutely normal and in fact, a somewhat intelligent response. Um, but then the next thing is, um, don't be afraid of being afraid. Don't try to get rid of it. 
just carry on while being afraid. And let me stop here and ask if there are any questions. Any questions? Comments? Comments would be good. Um, objections? I have a question. Please. Um, so how do you, you're saying like, don't be afraid of, you know, the, the fear, don't, you know, feel bad about it. But sometimes I feel that fear can kind of be um, a stopping point for a lot of people. Like it kind of stops you from doing the things that you actually want to do. So how can you kind of push past that fear that, you know, ignore it or anything like that because uh, a certain amount of fear is healthy, but actually kind of like work, I guess, alongside your fear and not let it stop you from doing what you want to do. I think you just answered your own question. And I love your metaphor. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think, um, I mean, you said it, work alongside your fear. I mean, the, the worst thing to do is to try to push the fear away, to try to not feel it, because that gets you so tangled up that you really can't, um, I mean, that's paralyzing. If you're trying to say, I am not afraid when you are, that doesn't work. But, you know, if you, if you acknowledge it, it's like, I'm terrified. I mean, what, what, I find, what finally happened with me sitting in the corner of my friend's living room, feeling like I was sailing off the edge of the world, is that I um, eventually the thought entered my mind well, something will happen. And I don't know why exactly that was consoling, but I was able to get up and cook lunch. Um, and, you know, that's true. Something will happen. Um, I'm seeing a lot of comments in the chat. I'll take a look at them. Um, Well, okay, this is wonderful. Um, okay, a lot of people saying, hooray, it's good to be talking about this. That's, I'm, you just made me very happy. Um, someone says, I try to turn my fear into motivation. That's uh, Natalie. Um, I'd be interested to hear how do you do that? Natalie, do you want to say another thing, something about that? Um, sure. Let me see. It's, I, I don't know if I do it intentionally, but the amount of energy I use towards um, dealing with fear or the anxiety that I get, um, I try to step back and look at it from a different perspective and take all that energy that I use turn direction and motivate me. What am I afraid of? So the things that I'm afraid of, maybe I can tackle those things or who am I comparing myself to? That's a good one. Yes. Yeah, that's great. You're reminding me of actually the best advice I, I training I got in fear, which was from my mother um, who, um, I mean, I remember this in high school. Um, you know, she would ask, how, how are you? Um, you know, I'm, you know, I'm scared. What are you scared about? Well, I have this um, geometry final and I'm really scared about it. What are you scared about? Afraid I might fail. Okay, what's, what's the worst thing that could happen? I, would, I could fail. Okay, if that happens, what will you do? Um, well, I guess I'll just have to retake it in summer school. You know, can you do that? Yes. Okay. So, I mean, that, that training in what's the worst thing that can happen? Um, and then if that happens, how will, you, how will you deal with this? Okay. Um, 
Charlotte, there's a great question in the chat that's gotten some responses, some wonderful responses already, but I'd like to share it or- Yeah, please. Would like to share out, um, do let me know. But she asks how to deal with other people's fear on us or on yourself. Um, for example, she names parents being afraid. Yes, yes. Of prospects. I'm, I'm sort of dumbstruck, which is kind of a uh, reflection of my own experience. First of all, I was across country. And my parents didn't know quite very what I was doing. And I think they were terrified, but they also didn't load it on me. So I mean, I, I think one thing would be, do you have a plan B? You know, if I if I can't make some kind of spectacular jump into a very profitable startup. What's plan B? Um, you know, that's, that's certainly one thing. That, that's the best I can do. Um, my, my, my hope is that the LCL is going to present you with enough examples of other things you could do besides being a professor that you'll be able to talk to your parents and say, I'm in the midst of making decisions. I have, I have just been presented with so many options. I'm trying to weigh which direction to go and how many of them I can pursue at once. And these are what? just to have real money behind. What a good idea. <clears throat> um, okay, so going on in the chat, there's an interesting point about um, Fear might come from outside us and be pushed on us. And maybe if we become aware, we don't have to internalize this. This is Kelly Evans. Thank you. Um, that's, also, that's also a good point. Um, and I, I think I'm going to put that off until we talk about identity. Um, because I think that will come up again. Great, great questions out loud and in the chat. I think we should move on just in the interests of time. Next slide, please. Okay, so I, I want to talk here about um, the kind of a kind of uncertainty that happens when you are thinking about making a transition. And the the academic career has a very well marked out trajectory of you know stages. That, you know you you go to college, you go to graduate school. Uh, you know, you know the you know the stages of graduate school. Then either you get a job as an assistant professor or you get a postdoc, um, and then you go through and you, you know, you you have to go up for tenure within seven years or whatever your university is, et cetera, et cetera. And the stages are very, very, very well marked out. And Many other ways of making a living don't have this kind of structure. I mean, I think as, as um, academics or people who've certainly been up that ladder, um, we sort of think that that's how things are structured. And that isn't true. I mean, there are, there are you know, there are certain kinds of, um, informal structurings or um, rules of thumb about to count yourself as a, su a success. Uh, you should have made so much money by the time you were 35 or things like that, but they're, they're not official. Um, so just thinking about this structure matter, um, think about the difference between a career and a job. Um, which I only really discovered in my 40s. Um, you know, I was working with a colleague at a research institute who had a very strong sense. He, he was also not in the academy, but 
you know, very much publishing and networked into the academy at a research institute. I mean, he he would be talking about, well, I've had, an in, you know, I've had an opportunity to give a keynote address at this conference or lead a session at this conference and which one will be more useful for my career. And I was, stu I was stunned. I had no idea of managing my research career like that. And, you know, as I was talking to him, I realized my parents were both working class. My father was a machinist. My mother was a secretary. They had jobs. There was no trajectory. You, you know, you, you might quit a job or be fired from a job and get another job and one job might be better than another. But the real binary was, I have a job, I don't have a job. And that's very different from a career which has stages and success and failure and how do I manage it? How do I network it? Um, you know, I, I mentioned this partly because there are a lot of class implications that are so subtle that, you know, you don't necessarily consider them. I, you know, think also about even, I, I should correct that slide. What's the difference between a job and gig work? So, you know, we have other, you know, all of these um, situations of precarity, you know, also have to do with, with uncertainty. Now, one of the things that trajectory is good at is letting us know how we're doing. Uh, am I where I should be at this stage in my career? Am I a success or a failure? Um, I'm gonna leave the last bullet and, and come back to it, but I'd, I'd like to see if there are any questions or comments about this one. Yes, please. Who is this? Yeah, so, um, uh, I, my name is Wei Lai. Oh, so, hi. Um, hi. When you are talking about the difference between a career and a job and big work, um, are you trying to um, make the point that some of them are better than others and like lead to a brighter future? Or do you think they are just ways of making a life? <laughs> um. That's actually a very interesting question. I mean, it, it, I would say it has taken me a long time of um, a very unstructured career of bouncing around from here to there um, to get over nostalgia for um, the, the structured nature of the academy. And I mean, I, there, was a, there was a while when I couldn't really say, you know, that's pretty stifling. Um, I, you know, I, I'm looking forward to adventuring because I was afraid that it was gonna be sour grapes. Um, now, I really feel like, um, I kind of, I, I, I like somewhat less structure, but that's me. I'm not saying that that's true, uh, you know, you know, it, I think it's really more like, I, I want to identify these issues for you so that you can see what your own response to them is, or if you're talking with somebody else, what their response is, um, you know, and see which, which fits you. I mean, there's also this wonderful, um, I didn't put it on here, but this wonderful uh, concept that musicians have of this is my day job, okay? Which means I make money from it so that I can uh, go to the, um, the blues uh, bar and perform at night. And that's what I really care about. And, you know, a day job can be better or worse, but it's not what I'm really about. I was certainly thinking exactly that, that it's the creatives who take gig work in order to pay the bills when it's their, their creative work, their writing, their music, their art, or something like that. That's really their passion, but they know the economy won't support it. 
And so they get a, a job or a, a gig work to help support their habit of creative work, which is where their heart is and their identity is. I mean, I will say I have published two books and a number of articles um, which were not paid for by the work that I was doing. Um, some, of, some of the articles were the, um, the books were passion projects and I, you know, I had, I had jobs that didn't mind that I did it on weekends or they might be even proud of me afterwards, but they certainly weren't paying me to do it. So you know, then that's, I, I say, well, okay, if, if this is a day job, is it a good, you know, is, is it functioning well? Okay. Um, yeah, is there something besides success or failure? I think I'm gonna leave that one for now. I think, I think we'll come back to it. Um, next slide, please. Okay, big topic, identity. Um, this one I can say very personally was, you know, in that same time of terror that I told you about, um, I was negotiating with NASA to um, do a project they wanted me to do. It was a wonderful project. It was on um, communication problems in the cockpit during, um, Aviation acts, commercial, commercial aviation accidents. Some of you may have seen this work where there was nothing wrong with the plane and the, there was an accident. So something must have been gone wrong at, at the communicative level. So we had decided they wanted me to do this. And I was, I was trying to um, go through the contracting pro, uh, process with them. Um, I, was not, I was not attached to a university. So I didn't know where to run the money through. And they said, so the, the, the biggest lie that has ever been told to me um, in, in my professional life, start your own little company. It's easy. All right, I'm getting the right response from Nancy who knows what I'm, what, knows what I'm talking about. It's not easy, but I was, you know, in, in, the, in the course of trying to set this up, I was also trying to figure out who am I, you know? Um, Definitely, um, you know, am I a businesswoman? Am I, uh, you know, I, I hadn't come up yet with socio rocket scientists. You know, am I a mad scientist? Am I a female mad scientist? What do the female mad scientists look like? And I remember walking along one day and thinking I need, as soon as I make my first little success, I need a, lab coat, raw silk, hand tailored in Italy, lab coat, to, to express who, who it is I am and maybe then I'll know what it is. So, I mean, this is a silly story, but it, um, you know, it, it's, it's an externalization of um, this question of, well, who am I? I, you know, I, I used to think I was a linguist. When I was in graduate school, I was so intoxicated with linguistics that if you woke me up at three in the morning and said, what are you? If, if you said, who am, who are you? I'd probably say Charlotte. But if you, if you asked me, um, what are you? I would say, I'm a linguist and very proudly. And then came the, the at some point to say, well, am I still a linguist? And, you know, if I start running my own business, taking on various consulting work, taking on work, contract work from NASA, um, learning how to do the books, et cetera, et cetera. Am I still a linguist? Nancy and I have had some wonderful arguments about this. Um, you know, does it matter? Um, Nancy is working very hard. Nancy and all everybody involved in this conference are working very hard to convince the, uh, the LSA that Yes, these folks are still linguists. Um, so, I mean, sometimes I think it is, sometimes I think it matters, sometimes I think it doesn't matter. Um, one way it certainly matters is if you have research that you want to continue to do, 
I mean, one, one thing that says I am still a linguist is, well, I'm, I'm publishing. And that's sort of like, I am taking a turn in a long conversation of other linguists in linguistics journals. And so I'm, you know, I, I am still a linguist, but why else it might matter? Personal branding is so tricky. Um, okay, here, here's a, a comment in the chats. Um, okay, I was gonna come to this issue of personal branding later, but I think, um, I just want, I want to say there um, to agree, yes, it is so tricky and it's not clear how true it is. I, I recommend that you read Ilana Gershon's work on personal branding. Um, it's also not clear that it's, it's what actually gets people jobs, but, and it's a, it's a tremendous amount of work. So if it's not useful, you're putting in a lot of identity work for not very much um, outcome. So let me talk about some identity issues for professors remaining in the academy. Um, you know, why, why is this an issue to you? Um, well, you should know something about, I mean, I think any, any, anybody in the academy who is here already is trying to do that, find out what your students may be facing. Um, you may be considering a ch career change of your own. Um, you may be facing identity issues or ethical issues about being a professor. Sort of as you look at what uh, the job market that your students were trained for and then the job market that they face, um, I, I will say for myself, I consider this an unjust system where you have, if you've got graduate schools pumping out PhDs, um, you know, any given university could put out in a year more PhDs than there are academic jobs across, you know, say the entire country. Um, and that's been going on for decades. Um, I consider that an unjust system. And for a professor, that means, I mean, in some sense, you're working in an unjust system, and how do you, how do you handle that? Um, you know, to have responsibility um, without an without authority in an unjust system, it's a very difficult position. So this there's this very frequent um, advice about you know managing your pro professional identity or your brand is. Um, it, you know, is, is something that's frequently offered. Um, okay. Um, and in a sense, the story I told about my friend who was managing his career, I mean, he was, you know, he was well along in his career, but he knew that, or I mean, he believed it was true. And he acted accordingly. Um, what my frequently offered advice is, is, um, it is, it is definitely important to have some sense of um, what your identity is. I mean, when, when, during the time that I was starting my own business, I was also writing my book on life stories. So I, you know, I had a meta interest in how you tell stories. Um, for a very brief period, when I got very dogmatic about life stories, um, I, I said, you know, these are constructions, they're, you know, they're social constructions, and I don't want them. And so I, I, for a couple of months, I tried to have, you know, with my, you know, my, my friends and my um, former, co you know, colleagues and fellow graduates, and I tried not to have a story. That was a complete bust. I mean, if you don't have a story, other people will give you one and you probably won't like it. So I came to the conclusion that, well, I, I need to have a, an, a, an identity, a, pers a professional identity, um, but don't, don't believe it 100%. 
I mean, I think it's when you start to believe your own stories that um, it gets um, it gets very sticky. You know, at the same time, you don't want other people. It's I mean, here here is a little story about um, different cultures. Um, when I first started um, this business of, be, of um, starting my own business, I was living in Berkeley. And when I said, I'm starting, my, you know, I'm starting my own consulting firm, in Berkeley, people thought that's a euphemism for, um, oh, you're unemployed. Then I moved to Silicon Valley and I was having my hair cut and you know, with a nude hairdresser who wanted to know, what do you do? So, oh, I'm starting my own consulting firm. Oh, that's great. You know, Hewlett Packard started in a garage. So it was like the, you know, one place knew how to support the identity that I was trying to create. The other one didn't. And they're you only know. 40 miles apart. Exactly. Um, any questions? We have in the chat here. Um, I will also say that I had a, an identity change kind of forced on me by the outside culture that somewhere about 20 years into my professional career, um, I was publishing. And I noticed when I so I, three years in a row, um, I submitted abstracts to the LSA and they were, they were um, rejected. I was also sub, uh, um, submitting abstracts to the Anthropology Association. I was never rejected. So after a while I thought, well, maybe I'm, you know, linguistics has gone a little bit this way. I've gone a little bit this way. Maybe I'm an anthropologist. Um, and then it turned out when I moved to NASA um, full time, I, I would be introduced. If I said I'm a linguist, they would think formal linguistics. Ah, yes, robotic, you know, robots and communication, which is totally what I don't do. If I said I'm an anthropologist and I, you know, I work on um, work on issues of um, institutional memory, which for them meant knowledge management. So I would call it knowledge management. Um, and I'm getting very interested in NASA's culture. They said, oh boy, do we need you. So it's like, okay, here I am definitely an anthropologist. So that, that was very interesting. It was like the world shifted a little bit. I shifted a little bit. I shifted into another world. Um, I have, you know, I have a, an identity which is now useful where the one that I had before isn't working. So that's kind of interesting. Um, next slide, please. That's it. That's it. Okay. You did Wonderful. it. Perfect. Yeah. On time. Okay. Uh, somebody, somebody asked me a lovely question in the chat, which was, what is a socio-rocket scientist? And that's a, a title I totally um, made up. <clears throat> and I used to use it in speech, but I wanted it on my business card and I couldn't figure out how to punctuate it. And eventually I was talking to a dear friend um, who, who, who gave me the, 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 the punctuation, which is socio rocket with an internal capital uh, dash scientist. I mean, I, I wanted to say I'm a social scientist working at NASA. And furthermore, they made me pay for my own business cards. So I thought, okay, if I have to pay for my damn business cards. Um, I can give myself whatever title I want. Very Silicon Valley of you, I must say. Yes, well, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, an, uh, that's another story about, um, about managing identity. Exactly. Jyoti says, how does, how does anyone ever get or have money for a startup? Um, that is a very complicated question. 
and increasingly ritualized in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, in terms of what the stages are and what is angel funding and what is venture capital funding, uh, there are people who start things on Patreon um, or GoFundMe. Um, I actually, I don't know very much about it, um, but I am sure that there are people who do. Um, okay, so uh, Neda says, academia pays little, linguistics departments pay least. Does this bother you as well? Um, I hadn't thought about it because I, it's been so long since I've been paid by a, an academic department that you know it has it hasn't come my way but yes I mean I, I think it's a it's another um, example of what's happening to um, liberal arts and social sciences so it bothers me in that in that way it says my personal fear is how to get request benefits I'm afraid of speaking out about a chronic disease That's a hard one. Uh, let me let me jump in for one second, and we should. This, this is a topic that can get taken up in office hours or in some less formal gather session. But let me say this: in the U.S., you are protected while you are interviewing and until you become a um, an employee, and you don't have to reveal these things. At the point that you get offered the job then is the time that you get to say, I need the following accommodations, okay? And whatever those are, I can only work four hours at a stretch. I have to be able to have my own food cooked properly. I need this extra equipment because of my disability, but you don't have to reveal those things until a job offer is made and accepted. Thank you. Uh, Joseline had- Other countries will differ. So, yeah. you know, the rules about disability or any kind of health issues are revealed later. But I know a lot of people who have corporate jobs when they would like to have a startup job because they have some kind of a disabling condition that needs very fancy medical insurance. Right. Um, Jocelyn had her hand up. Hello. Nice meeting you. Thank you so much for your talk. Okay. Um, my you. question is about um, your social rocket uh, science. Do yeah. you, uh, just what I'm picturing is that you maybe watch or listen to recorded interactions and then analyze them? Is that what you do or can you explain a little bit of? Well, I mean, I first, I mean, I first got involved with NASA um, as a consultant and it was exactly to do uh, with the transcripts of aviation accidents and um, you know, analyzing them for um, labor contractual reasons, I could not get to hear them. So it, it was you know, quite frustrating in that manner, but I, you know, I was just looking at what are patterns. So you know, later when I uh, was brought back, when I came back to NASA, I was brought by a friend who I had previously worked with in another job. He was a computer scientist in the, com in the computer science department at uh, NASA in Mountain View. And he had gotten used to working with social scientists. So he did the work to get a slot to bring me over. And there, I mean, I worked on various things. I, I mean, I, I feel like um, what my real job was, was wherever I found myself to say things like, what about the people? You know, like we're designing a mission or, you know, I, I was on two or three different um, committees to help redesign the uh, replacement for the space shuttle. And, you know, my, my job was to say, you know, in, you know, find the places where we're not, um, we're not thinking about the people or um, talking about um, documentation of missions. Um, you know, well, you know, we'll just save all of the, um, the, docu the internal documents for the mission. Okay, but this is a mission that lasts 
25 years where you know, we're flying out beyond Jupiter, um, do you think people will still be able to read Word documents 30 years on? So, I mean, it was all over the place. So there's always going to be Craigslist. <laughs> okay. I think we are... Um... I think we're at time. Okay. And I really appreciate your willingness to come and open this topic for us. And I hope this is not the last conversation like this that we all have. Thank um, you. Mm -hmm.